This ASRock Phantom Gaming X870E Nova Wi-Fi motherboard sells for £380 here in the UK. By contrast, this Phantom Gaming X870 Noe Nova Wi-Fi sells for £305 here in the UK. Can an E possibly be worth £75? We're going to review the cheaper of the two motherboards today and see whether it is truly good value for money. When you look at a chart that breaks down the differences between the different AMD 800 series chipsets, you would agree with me that no, an E is not worth £75. Indeed, X870 and X870E can be literally identical, other than a few PCI Express lanes. But all the main features, they're the same, provided you're using a Ryzen 7000 or Ryzen 9000 processor that supports PCI Express Gen 5. However, I was being somewhat cruel to ASRock when I suggested an E could not be worth £75 because in fact this non-E and E motherboards do have a number of differences. For example, the VRMs, which are 18 plus 2 plus 1 by 80 amp SPS, here 20 plus 2 plus 1 times 110 amps and there are other differences. So in a sense the AMD naming scheme hasn't helped ASRock one little bit. The E difference is only the beginning of things, it's just an indication of what we're looking at. However, I'm going to park this more expensive motherboard that's close to £400 and we're going to focus on this motherboard which is priced just over £300. First impressions of the Phantom Gaming X870 Nova Wi-Fi are that it looks very smart. As you'd expect with a modern motherboard, the I.O. shield is fixed in place. We have some visual features going down across the shroud, across the SSD heatsinks and across the chipset heatsink. We can quickly release the primary M.2 heatsink and snap it back in place. The heatsinks below that, which would normally be obscured by the graphics card, are screwed down. So no quick release there. And we have quick release for the graphics card. Another useful little feature. Micro buttons up here. We also have a debug display, but we'll come to the feature shortly. In terms of accessories in the box, you get pretty much the bare minimum. Uh, there we have a temperature sensor. Oh, a little sticker. A keycap, Wi-Fi antenna, RGB cable, and a couple of SATA cables. We also get a note which they clearly forgot to include in the manual, which is telling us that if you occupy the third M.2 slot, it will disable the two SATA connectors. Although there are a total of five M.2s, one of which is dedicated to Wi-Fi support, so really four M.2s, depending on which M.2s you occupy, it depends exactly how the rest of the motherboard operates. For example, does the secondary PCI Express slot operate at its full bandwidth or is it halved? And indeed, can you connect to the two SATA or not? Flipping the board over, we have a full-size backplate with a large opening for the back of the CPU socket. There are thermal pads, so it's obviously helping to transfer heat away from the VRMs. Uh, you'll note there are multiple openings so you can actually release, for example, the VRM heat sinks without removing the backplate should you wish to do so. I found stripping the board down to take photos and to take a closer look at it was no problem whatsoever. And having said that, let's take a closer look at the features. The specification of this AM5 motherboard starts with the chipset, which is AMD X870, and the VRMs, which are 18 plus 2 plus 1 by 80 amp SPS, manufactured by Monolithic Power. The primary expansion slot is PCI Express Gen 5 by 16. The secondary slot is PCI Express 4 by 16 mechanically, but electrically times 4. If the fifth M.2 is occupied, the secondary slot is downgraded to Gen 4 by 2. There are five M.2s, two of them are Gen 5, two of them are Gen 4, 
and there's also a Gen 3 by 2 and you get two SATA 3 which is 6 gigabits per second. In terms of ports and connectors we have two USB 4 type C's rated at 40 gigabits per second on the rear I.O. panel. There's an internal USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 type C which is for front panel connection. There are two USB 3.2 Gen 2 type A's on the rear panel and three USB 3.2 Gen 1 type A's on the rear panel. There are also headers for four USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A's for front panel connection and a total of eight USB 2.0's, four at the rear, four at the front. Ethernet is 5 gigabit LAN and there's Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4. Other features include seven PWM fan headers, three ARGB headers, one 12 volt RGB header, micro buttons for power and reset, and also a BIOS debug display. If you're looking for a new chair, then definitely go and check out boolies.co.uk. They offer a whole host of gaming and office chairs that come in a variety of different finishes and different colors. The hardware in our test PC begins with an AMD Ryzen 9 9950X and the SSD is a Gen 5 Crucial T700 Pro. For memory we have 32GB of G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo RGB, dual channel DDR5-6000, power supply is a Seasonic Vertex GX1200, so that's 1200 watts gold rated ATX3. We apply some Arctic MX6 thermal compound to our processor. Our CPU cooler is a Fantex Glacier 1 360 D30, 360mm radiator with 30mm thick fans. And our graphics card is a Palette RTX 5080 GameRock OC. Taking a look around the BIOS setup screen, we see that in advanced we have the expected features. Switching over to the easy mode, basically you need to do almost nothing. If you want to update the BIOS or enable Expo, easy mode will do the job. Back in advanced mode, you can see we've left everything on auto. We have no interest in overclocking our Ryzen 9. If you want to set custom fan curves, as we have, you don't drag points around on a curve, instead you punch in numbers. So the fans, for example, run at 40% at 50 degrees and then ramp up to 60% at 75 degrees. There are no surprises in the BIOS and as we say, you can leave everything on auto and the system will perform perfectly fine. Let's start by taking a look at VRM operating temperature and see whether the heat sinks are up to the job. Our Ryzen 9 9950X is drawing 200 watts under load in Cinebench R23 with an ambient of 22 degrees Celsius. The VRM start at 35 degrees and after 9 minutes the temperature has risen to 46. In other words, icy cool. Adding a Noctua fan to the passive cooling system to mimic having a rear fan in your case. At the start of the Cinebench run the VRM temperature is 32 degrees rather than 35 and it increases to 41 degrees rather than 46. In other words the VRMs and their cooling system are absolutely fine. And let's take a quick look at some performance data. In my recent reviews of Threadripper 9970X and 9980X I used the Ryzen 9 9950X, Core Ultra 9285K and Core i9 14900K as some of the comparators. In in that review, the Ryzen 9 9950X was running on an MSI MPG X870E carbon Wi Fi motherboard with the same G Skill DDR5 6000 memory and the same Gen 5 SSD. In Cinebench R23 multi core, we can see the motherboard makes almost no difference to the performance 40,527 against 40,765. And when we look at the Zen 4 and Zen 5 Threadrippers with 32 cores, just to put some context on things, that difference of 200 or so points is utterly trivial. Cinebench R23 single core, amazingly similar scores for the two motherboards running Ryzen 9 9950X, 2266, 2273. In effect, the ASRock and the MSI are identical, and it's a similar story in Blender Classroom. The ASRock runs one second quicker than the MSI, which is certainly within the margin of error. In 7-zip in the decompressing benchmark, we see the MSI has a tiny lead over the ASRock, but effectively it's a dead heat. And it's the same tiny gap in the 7-zip compressing benchmark. In both instances, the MSI is in the lead, but the difference is not significant. And finally, we have memory bandwidth. And this really tells the tale. 
the AMD Ryzen's are using dual channel memory and are at the bottom of this small chart in a dead heat between the ASRock and the MSI. Intel beats AMD, which is traditional, and Threadripper, which is using quad channel memory, absolutely crushes the dual channel boys. So in the memory bandwidth test, there's no difference between ASRock and MSI. And so we come to my conclusions about the ASRock Phantom Gaming X870 Nova Wi-Fi, and it's a perfectly decent motherboard, but it's neither super duper high end nor budget cheap. It's somewhere in the middle. And the snag is that as a mid-range motherboard, it gets beaten in my view by competition. One example that comes directly to mind is the MSI Mag X870 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, which is 50 pounds cheaper than this board. And to my pros and cons. On the plus side, two USB 4 ports are included. Secondly, the 18 phase VRM is substantial. And thirdly, and I haven't mentioned it so far, there's discrete onboard lighting under the armor at the bottom of the board. Looks very nice. Cons, the negatives. The MSI Mag X870 Tomahawk Wi-Fi is £50 cheaper and it reviewed very well. Secondly, the M.2 configuration can impact the second PCI Express slot and also the SATA connectors, depending on which slots you populate. Thirdly, and this might be an unreasonable criticism as I've demonstrated the VRMs operated at a very low temperature, but the two heat sinks are not linked and the shroud substantially covers the main heat sink. They could have made the shroud smaller. They could have linked the heat sinks with a heat pipe to transfer heat away. I don't think technically it's necessary. It just seems to me that for very little cost, it would have made it better in some intangible way. Perhaps that sums up my feeling about this motherboard, slight confusion. Uh, overall, I'm giving it a worth buying award and eight out of 10. Do please check us out at kickguru.net. And remember, we're on TikTok.